Help me welcome to the stage, Alan Stein, Jr. The first time I met Kobe Bryant, he said something to me that changed my life forever. See, back in 2007, Nike flew me out to Los Angeles to work the first ever Kobe Bryant Skills Academy. Nike brought in the top high school and college players from around the country for an intense three-day mini camp with the best player in the world. And for any of you that don't follow basketball as closely as I do, just know that in 2007, Kobe was the best player in the game. Having grown up so closely around the game, I'd always heard this urban legend of how insanely intense Kobe's individual workouts were. So at my earliest opportunity, I walked up to Kobe and asked if I could watch one of his private workouts. He was incredibly gracious and smiled and said, sure, man, no problem, I'm going tomorrow at four. Well, I got a little bit confused. Well, Kobe recognized that confused look on my face and clarified that with, yeah, that's 4 a.m. If I was gonna be there anyway, I may as well try and impress Kobe. So I came up with the plan to beat him to the gym. So I set my alarm for 3 a.m. The next morning, the alarm goes off. I quickly jump up and I get myself dressed and I hop in a cab and I head to the gym. And yet the moment I step out of the cab, I could see the gym light was already on. I walk in the side door of the gym. Kobe's already in a full sweat. Well, out of professional courtesy, I didn't say anything to him. I didn't say anything to his trainer. I just sat down to watch. And for the first 45 minutes, I was shocked. For the first 45 minutes, I watched the best player on the planet do the most basic footwork and offensive moves. Kobe was doing stuff that I had routinely taught to middle school age players. But my curiosity kept eating away and it eventually overwhelmed me to the point that I had to know. So later that day at camp, I went up to him again and said, Kobe, I don't understand. You're the best player in the world. Why were you doing such basic drills? And he flashed that million dollar smile. He gave me a friendly wink, but he said in a very serious tone, why do you think I'm the best player in the world? Because I never get bored with the basics. Kobe Bryant, the best player on the planet, and someone that has truly mastered his craft, said that his secret is that he never got bored with the basics. And as you all know, we live in a world that tells us it's okay to skip steps, tells us we should always be looking for a shortcut or a hack, tells us we should constantly be chasing what's new and what's flashy and what's shiny and what's sexy. But I'm here to tell you when you do those things, you are making a huge mistake. And that's because the basics work. They always have, and they always will. Now, I would hope that the primary lesson from that story is blatantly obvious. And that is this coming Monday morning, I want every single one of you to show up for work at 3 a.m. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Here's what I do want you to do. I want you to spend the next several days getting crystal clear on the basics that you need to focus on. Now I realize we're just meeting now and getting acquainted, but I'm gonna ask you guys to trust me for a moment. I'm gonna have you do a mind-body connection exercise that I've done with the best basketball players in the world, and I wanna see how you stack up. I'm about to give you very basic instructions for a very basic task. Here's what I need. I want you to take your left hand and I want you to put it on your nose. I want you to take your right hand and wrap it around and put it on your left ear. When I say go, I want you to clap your hands twice as fast as you can and make the mirror image of that. You'll end up with your right hand on your nose and your left hand on your right ear. Go! Oh. Oh. As you can see, just because something is basic in premise doesn't mean that it's easy to execute. Now, my goal for being with you all today is also very basic. And that is, I want to add as much value to your lives and to your businesses as I can in our very short time together. I'm going to tell some stories and give you some stats and maybe have you do some things that make you feel a little uncomfortable and uncoordinated. But more importantly, I'm going to arm each and every one of you with a series of practical, actionable strategies that you and your teams can implement immediately to help you simplify success, improve your personal influence and impact, continue to build high-performing clinics, create that one ATI, and work towards being best in class by 2025. 
So let's take a look at perspective. Regardless of your title or tenure or role in this organization, I want you to view yourself as a leader. And in order to be an effective and influential leader, I want you to adopt the foundational mantra of transformational leadership, which is it's not about me, it's about you. As leaders, when you shift your focus off of what you want from people and you shift it to what you want for people, you become the most magnetic leader in the room. Now, if any of you ever need a reminder that it's not about you, I wanna encourage you to have children. <laughs> the second area where we need to heighten our clarity are core values. What do you stand for? What do you believe in? What are the non-negotiables that you use to make the most important decisions in your life? So you have to get crystal clear on those. Because every single decision you make, personally and professionally, individually and organizationally, you have to run through the filter of, is this in alignment with my core values or not? As leaders, when you learn to make your decisions and the way that you treat others and the way that you run your clinics based on your core values and your standards of excellence, instead of the ebb and flow and roller coaster of feelings and emotions, when you learn to lead based on core values and standards of excellence, you become the most consistent person in the room. Now, the third area that we have to heighten clarity is purpose. The why behind what you do. Don't get caught up in what you do. Be more connected to who you are. And that's why you all have to stay connected to that purpose. Now, on an organizational level, one of the best groups that I've ever seen do this is DHL. DHL has a presence in every single country in the world and has hundreds of thousands of team members. But they go to great lengths to make sure that every single member of that team, regardless of title or tenure, stays connected to the DHL purpose. And what is the DHL purpose? We don't deliver brown boxes, we deliver promises. They make sure that person knows you are not putting a brown box on a truck. You're putting a little kid's birthday gift on a truck. You're not putting a brown box on a truck. You're putting a future bride's wedding dress on a truck. See, when you can stay deeply connected to purpose and the decisions you make and the way you lead is based on that purpose, then you become the most inspirational person in the room. Each and every one of you on an individual level needs to have the self-awareness and be reflective enough to know where do your talents lie? What are the things that you bring to, you, to the table and to your clinic that can add a maximum contribution to everyone and everything around you? And you need to double down on those. Number two, at the local level, at each of your respective clinics, what do your collective talents look like? What are your collective gifts? How can you put the right people in the right positions so that you all can continue to work to be best in class? And then number three, on a national and a collective organizational level, what is it that separates you all? And whatever your answers to those three questions are, you need to invest time and resources into those. You need to double down on those. Any investment you make into a strength, taking it from good to great, is a very, very worthy investment. So I wanna ask you all a very important rhetorical question. I've already told you that my evaluation of you all is you are elite high performers, you are the Kobe Bryants of the physical therapy space, but I have a really important question to ask each and every one of you. Are you a high performer because of your habits? Or are you a high performer in spite of your habits? Here's your first actionable takeaway, AKA homework assignment. Sometime over the weekend, I want you to take out a piece of paper and I want you to draw a vertical line down the middle. On the left side, I want you to come up with an exhaustive list of the things that let's just say, fill your bucket physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, if that's appropriate to you. But I want you to come up with a list of the things that fill your bucket, the things that energize you, the things that make you smile, the things that make you feel alive. Then on the other side of the paper, on the right side, I want you to write down how you've been spending the bookends of your day, your morning and your evening routine. What do you typically do for the first 60 minutes after you wake up, and what do you typically do in the 60 minutes before you go to bed? And I want you to ask yourself, 
the most fundamental question you can ask yourself when it comes to raising your personal performance. And that is, are you doing the things you know you need to do to fill your bucket to show up as the best version of yourself? Now, if you do this with some honesty, you do this with some vulnerability, which will take a little bit of courage, every single person in this room, myself included, will start to uncover what's called a performance gap. And a performance gap is the gap between what we know and what we do. And the very first step to raising your game and heightening your individual performance is to start to close that gap, is to start to sprinkle some of the things from the left side of the paper onto the right side of the paper. And I promise you, if you can make the commitment to do that and invest in your self-care, you will see your performance, your productivity, your influence, your impact, your fulfillment, and your optimism start to escalate immediately. Now let's take a look at mindset, which I believe is the greatest separator. And I want to encourage each and every one of you to adopt what I call the winner's mindset. And the winner's mindset is waking up every single day, making a commitment to do the best you can with what you have wherever you are. When you do the best you can with what you have wherever you are, you automatically eliminate a trilogy of behaviors that I know from firsthand experience will undermine your performance, undermine your productivity, undermine your confidence, undermine your optimism, undermine your fulfillment. And those three behaviors are blaming, complaining, and making excuses. And another part of having an elite winner's mindset is understanding and accepting that adversity and challenge is always around the corner. You have to embrace and expect the fact that, that dark days are ahead. Now, some people say to me, Alan, how can you say that? You're a motivational speaker. Aren't you supposed to be positive? Okay. I'm positive that adversity <laughs> challenge and dark days are coming, so you need to make sure that you're prepared for them. And now let's shift to the third part that we have to heighten our self-awareness on, and that is focus. Write this acronym down, WIN, W-I-N. It stands for what's important now. Am I choosing to place my attention in what I believe is most deserving of it in this moment? Now, another way to say that uh, is something that I heard both Nick Saban and Oprah say, and I figure if those two people are saying it, it has to be true. And that is being present is simply being where your feet are. Be where your feet are. Wherever your feet are, make sure that's where your head and your heart are as well. We have to get all of our faculties in alignment. Back when I was in the basketball training space and had a chance to work with some remarkable players and some remarkable teams, um, in addition to helping them improve their on-court athleticism and bulletproofing their body against injury, my number one job was to get them to play present. And a cornerstone of playing present was next play. You just missed a wide open layup, it's all right, next play. You just turn the ball over, next play. I know the referee didn't make a call, it happens sometimes in basketball, next play. Why would I want my players focused on the next play? There's nothing they can do about the play that just happened. It's in the past, it's in the rear view mirror. It is now unchangeable. And I'm of the belief that there's only two things in this world we have 100% control over 100% of the time. That is our effort and our attitude. So I mentioned earlier that I have twin sons. And as twin sons like to do, they occasionally like to bicker, they like to fight, and they like to pick at each other. And about a year ago, I had my sons Luke and Jack with me, and they just kept going at it. And I was running a little bit short on patience. And I finally got to the point where I said, Jack, knock it off, you're irritating me. And he smirked and he said, Dad, I'm not irritating you. You're choosing to be irritated. <laughs> Touche, Jack. Touche. I didn't control that him and his brother were arguing and fighting, but I absolutely chose my response. So that's attitude. Now, the third component of refocusing the lens to be in the present moment is to refocus it on the process. See, it is fantastic to have goals. It is fantastic to have a North Star. They provide clarity and they provide direction. But once you have the North Star crystallized, you can take your eyes off of it and you need to put it on what's right in front of you. The daily behaviors, the action steps, execution of the playbook. You have to focus on the process. The best analogy I can think of 
is if you're ever tasked with building a brick wall, don't worry about the wall. Focus on the bricks. Don't worry about the wall, focus on the bricks. Take each and every brick and set it exactly where it needs to go. And if you can lay every single brick with care and precision, guess what? The wall will take care of itself. Now, when it comes to our habits, when it comes to our mindset, when it comes to uh, our ability to refocus, no one has done those better than my all-time favorite basketball player, Steve Nash. And in the first year that he won the MVP, he actually only led the league in two statistical categories. The first, which most people would guess, would be assists. But you know the other statistic that Steve Nash led the NBA in? Physical touches. I'm actually talking about high fives, fist bumps, and pats on the backside. Well, it just so happens there was a research team from UC Berkeley who was conducting an official study because they wanted to measure if showing signs of physical enthusiasm actually led to more wins on the court. So they hired a team of researchers to watch every minute of every NBA game and make a tally mark every time a player gave a high five, a fist bump, or a pat on the backside. Well, the Phoenix Suns, who Steve Nash played for at the time, were so enamored with this study that they hired a full-time intern to count just for Steve Nash. Just by show of hands, how many of you have ever had a crappy entry-level job before? <laughs> Can you imagine if that was your first job? Yeah, you see this guy right here? Every time he touches one of these big, tall, sweaty guys, you can make a tally mark. <laughs> In the very first game that the intern counted for Steve Nash, he delivered 239 high fives, fist bumps, and pats on the backside. He was a furnace of human connection. Just to make sure I'm clear and HR compliant, I'm not telling you guys to pat your patients on the backside <laughs> when they leave your clinic. Here's what I am telling you to do. As leaders, figure out innovative and creative ways that you can make the same type of emotional deposit without a physical touch. Here's another homework assignment. And this one, I'm, I'm speaking primarily to the clinic directors. I want you all to execute this. It's called the big three. I want you to make the time to schedule a quick one-on-one -on -one meeting with every single person at your clinic, regardless of title or tenure or position, and you're gonna conduct what's called the Big Three Audit. Here's how you do that. You ask them to write down, what are your three most important duties to our clinic, or most important responsibilities? Or what are the th three things you can do to make a maximum contribution to everyone and everything around you? If you're only gonna do three things in a given day, what do you think those three things should be? and get them to write those three things down. Then as the clinic director, I want you to write down what you think their big three are. Not yours, theirs. What do you think are their three most important duties or responsibilities? What do you think, knowing them and their skill sets are the three ways they can make a maximum contribution to the clinic? That if they're gonna show up on Monday and only do three things, what are the three things that you want them to be most focused on? And then to complete that audit, similar to the one we did earlier, you just compare the two sets of notes. You compare their notes, their big three with your big three, and you see how much alignment there is. Don't be surprised if there's a little bit of misalignment between what they think they should be doing and what you think they should be doing. But don't let that frustrate you and don't let that discourage you. Actually look at that as a gift. That is an invitation for you all to reconcile and get on the same page. Because ultimately that's what will create the efficiency. That's what will help you all continue to create high-performing clinics. Use it as an invitation. Don't rule with an iron fist and take their card and rip it up and say, uh-uh, here's the three things you need to be doing. Instead, lean in with curiosity and fascination. Accountability. Holding someone accountable is something you do for them. It's not something you do to them. Because when you hold someone accountable to a high standard of excellence, in essence, what you're saying is I care so much about you and I care so much about our clinic and I care so much about ATI, I'm not gonna let you get away with doing less than you're capable of. Just know as leaders, you are always communicating. Even when you're not speaking, you're communicating. And I'm not just talking about nonverbals. I'm not just talking about facial expressions and body language and tonality and posture. 
I'm talking about the under, underpinnings and unconscious messages of what it is that we actually say. Perfect example, you delegate something to someone on your team. And delegation is a really important skill to get good at as leaders because if every single thing goes through you and you have to do every single person's job, you become the bottleneck. You become the person that slows down progress. So we have to get good at delegating. When you delegate something of importance, when you ask a teammate for help, what's the unconscious message that you send them? I trust you. I believe in you. I think you're good enough. That's why I'm asking for your help. That type of unconscious message will strengthen your relationship with that person. What happens if you delegate or you ask for help and then you micromanage? You either literally or figuratively stand over their shoulder, breathing down their neck, making sure they cross every T and dot every I. What's the unconscious message you send then? It's the exact opposite. I don't trust you. I don't believe in you. I don't think you're good enough to get this done. It is not what you say. It's what they hear that matters. You say, I need your help. You micromanage, and what they hear is Alan doesn't trust me. Alan doesn't believe in me. Alan doesn't think I'm good enough to do this without him standing there. And that will quickly erode and undermine your connection with that person. And just know that when it comes to communication, when it comes to accountability, when it comes to role clarity, little things make a big difference. I'm a huge believer in the how you do anything is how you do everything mantra. In 2008, I was working as the basketball performance coach at Montrose Christian, a small private school just north of Washington, D.C. that has churned out dozens of players in the NBA. Our most famous alum is Kevin Durant. I thought this was gonna be a normal day of practice and I walk through the gym doors and I'm standing three arms lengths away from the one person in the world I wanted to meet more than anyone. I mentioned him earlier, Coach K, the former basketball coach at Duke. Now, Coach K was kind enough to talk to me for 10 minutes before practice started. And as epiphanal as this exchange was, I don't remember a single word that either one of us said. I was in total fanboy mode. I don't remember a single word. But I'll never forget how he made me feel. He made me feel like I was the most important person in the gym. I was raised that when someone goes out of their way to do something nice for you, you handwrite them a thank you note. So I went home that night and I hand wrote him a thank you note, said something to the effect of Coach K, you have no idea how amazing it was to finally meet you. Thank you so much for your time. Always rooting for you and Duke. Put a stamp on it, sent it off to Durham, North Carolina. And I figured that would be that. Well, three weeks later, I go to my mailbox and I get a letter back from Coach K. For those of you in the cheap seats that can't see this, <laughs> it's, it's three sentences of his iconic handwriting on the front of his stationery that in essence says the same thing. No, Alan, it was so wonderful to meet you. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. How long do you think it took him to write this, even if he writes slow? Maybe 60 seconds? Can we agree that over the course of our entire life, can we agree that 60 seconds is a little thing? Well, this little thing had a profound impact on my life. So just know as leaders, the little things you do make a huge difference. I wanna end on some energy. I'm gonna put my left palm up. When my right palm crosses over my left palm, I want you guys to clap. But here's the thing. I don't wanna hear 792 separate claps. I wanna hear one clap, one voice, one ATI. Basic instructions, basic task. I'll go slow, just in case some of you are a little bit slow. <laughs> All right, you guys ready? Let's end on a high note. Okay. As you can see, you still have some work to do, so do it. Thank you, guys. Thank you.